Hey everybody, this is Sam with Subterranean Annihilation. I got Ben Price and Jay Cardinal from one of the heaviest bands on the planet, Faux Hammer. Thanks you guys for taking the time to do this. No problem. Glad to be here. Yeah, thank you, Sam. So let me start by saying I'm a huge fan. I think I've seen you guys probably like seven times. So let's start at the beginning. What inspired each of you to play music? I think, uh, honestly, it was like my parents, they like encouraged me to play music because they're both musicians. But, you know, we had like, uh, like music in elementary school. And like when I, when I was in fourth grade, it was like, yeah, you should pick an instrument. I was like, yeah, drums. That sounds cool. <laughs> so that's how it started. And then I pretty much like got into like rock and metal eventually over the next couple of years, like, you know, I actually found this CD binder with like Rage Against the Machine in it. Okay. I think that like got me into heavy stuff, just like randomly. Yeah, that first uh first couple Rage Against the Machine uh CDs I had were life changing for sure. Yeah, for sure. Like not not only music, that got me into like thinking about politics actually instead of like not knowing anything about it. Yeah. So that was cool. But, yeah, you know. You you go from there to whatever, Metallica, Slayer, Sepultura, like get into death metal. Hopefully not. Are. Hopefully not. Uh, new Sepultura or Soulfly. Oh yeah, tons of new Sepultura and Soulfly. <laughs> <laughs> oh god. So what about you, Jay? Um. So I actually have a have a similar situation to Ben. Both of my parents were musicians. Um, my parents actually met at going to conservatory. Um. So I can't I can't remember a time in my life that I wasn't, you know sitting at a piano and, and plunking away at it or, you know, um, helping my dad turn pages at a pipe organ, um, or something like that, you know? Um, but I think it was, you know, probably seventh grade. I, I had some friends who kind of clued me into some local music, uh, like local punk bands, um, Frodis and the suspects were both like kind of active at that time. And, you know, 95, you know, Fairfax, Virginia. Um, right so, you know, I kind of got clued into that and started going to some local shows and stuff. And of course, immediately, you know, the, the idea was implanted in my brain, like you could do this. <laughs> um, and I found out that my dad had a guitar in the house and I started plunking away on the guitar. And about after a year, you know, they got me lessons or actually my grandmother paid for a year of lessons for me for my birthday one year. Um, and it just snowballed from there, you know, and eventually I realized like, Hey, I'm not really interested in playing this kind of like blues rock, uh, stuff that everybody, not that there's anything wrong with blues rock, but it kind of tends to be the predominant genre when we're talking about your mainstream sort of Sam Ash going, you know, yeah. uh, p uh, public or, but you know, musician populace or something. Um, but, uh, Anyway, um, you know, I kind of obviously was like, I, I want to learn punk songs. And then I realized, well, I don't really need a teacher to help me learn punk songs. I can just listen to the records and figure it out. Hell yeah. And then um, eventually, I think it was um, 97, I was like 17 or 18. I joined my first band called Angel Eyes and just went from there and just was in bands ever since, basically. And it's been a part of me. And if I'm ever like in a place where I'm not able to play music... Like right now, I start going a little insane. Yeah, I understand that for sure. Uh, getting into Faux Hammer, what inspired Faux Hammer musically? How did you start playing that kind of stuff? Well, I think I kind of have to answer that. <laughs> but, um, well, so, I mean, it, I hit one of those musical lulls at a certain point, and I realized that, like, a really, really large part of my taste was always kind of heavy stuff and by heavy not just metal but like the more slower doom the end of things um and i really needed to try to pour my efforts into doing something in that vein but without trying to make it only that but let's just make some whatever naturally comes out but in that kind of genre you know um and it just went from there um you know um, Ben, who I had been in many bands with, um, for years, as well as Joe, not me. um, both expressed, not, sorry, not Ben Price. We had another drummer at first, um, Ben Blanton, who played with us, um, for several years. And, um, 
an amazing drummer and uh he he helped us get this thing off the ground as well as joe um and that was about it and you know um we had that lineup for a few years and then um you know the personal differences and um we had known uh ben price um because we went on tour with one of his older bands um elegabalus who are still active but i think not super active if i'm active <laughs> um but we we thought Elagabalus were one of the the best bands around at that time when we went to do our first tour, and uh, I had known Dustin, who's the other half of that duo, um, for many many years. And like, not only could I not think of some nicer guys to want to spend a bunch of time with over a course of days, but also um, their music is some of the most amazing mind bending um genre blending music I've ever heard. So it was like a no brainer. And then obviously when we were on tour with them, I found a lot like, hey, this Ben Price guy not only is an amazing drummer, but um a really amazing person too, and someone that maybe I wouldn't mind being in a band with myself. So um when the opportunity presented, it was almost a, a no brainer to ask Ben to join. Uh, ben Price, that is. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's awesome how it works out like that. And Ben, if you want to send me a song from that project, I'd love to post it on the channel. So this next question is from my fiance Amber, actually. Oh, why are you so heavy? <laughs> <laughs> Probably all the cheese. <laughs> <laughs> for, for me personally, um, but not to evade the question, um, well, I just love when that feeling hits you in the chest when you see a band um and it just like churns your organs around oh yeah <laughs> i think you guys might have tickled my brain last time <laughs> i hope that that's true <laughs> so a lot of the riffs are really off time which is awesome i love that do you ever use a metronome no. yeah i do i practice a lot <laughs> but, like for foam hammer it's like this is the be- like Ella Gabalus, what we were talking about before. We played to a click and shit because we got a bunch of like samples and like synth uh, sequences going on. So when I first joined Fohammer, it was like cool because it's like this is the band where the tempo is all to me. It's like free. It's like you can mess with the tempo, not be in like a like a grid kind of thing. It's like some things go faster and slower. And that's something that like. I thought was cool about the music that has existed before I joined too. And I wanted to keep that up. Yeah. It's a lot of uh, tempo changes, even, even changing mid riff, which I think is awesome. And it has a very, it pulls you into it. Uh, So a little bit uh, on the subject of older stuff. I always liked the song Thrain on the 2014 demo and correct me (laughs) if I'm wrong, but I haven't heard it live. And is there a reason it didn't make it to the Faux Hammer debut? There's a funny story about that. So um, we have some friends who, um, my friend uh, Rob Moore um, was in a band uh, called Salome. Um, and and our bands at that time when that band was active used to play a lot. And I also used to actually have a, a job with him um, at Tower Records back in the day. But anyhow, um, so he and another guy, Jamie Healy, who we also know and like very much, who uh, is part of Old Town Luthery uh, up in Baltimore, um, used to have a band called Thrain. <laughs> and it was funny because I was like, that's really funny. We just started a band called Hammer, um, obviously in the same <laughs> sort of legendarium, right? Well, so um, what happened was Thrain had said to us, you guys should write a song called Thrain, and we'll have a song called Fohammer. <laughs> and that was the idea. And so we had this song that was one of the original sort of glut of songs that I had just written sort of on my own with Ben when the original intent was to just be a two-piece. Um, and um, that song I just basically had not written lyrics to yet and was like, well, I could really easily write this to be about Thrain. <laughs> and so uh, that's that's what it became. If you don't know, Thrain uh, was um, Thorin's uh, grandfather, I believe, if I'm not getting that wrong. Um, but anyway, uh, getting a little deep in the Tolkien lore. But, you know, at the end of the day, we kind of 
um, we didn't play that song as much live. It wasn't a, a huge part of our set. It just kind of, eh. When we, when we were doing the thing with Noel, uh, Noel Mueller of, um, uh, Grimoire. Well, when we were doing the thing with Noel, um, he really had expressed that he wanted to do an EP and to keep it under sort of a certain amount of time. Um, and so that song just kind of didn't make the cut. Um, I wouldn't be opposed to eventually reworking it or something, but we've never honestly discussed it. And, uh, the song Jotnar. What, just holy fuck is heavy as hell. Um, <laughs> the debut self-titled album is in my constant doom rotation. Let me first say I think live is the best way to experience the crushing trance-like weight of the music. But this album does a damn good job capturing that. Uh, Jay, what was your recording process during this time? So uh, that was the one that we did with Noel. Um, Noel does like a mobile studio or did a mobile studio, um, thing at that time. I believe now he's doing more at his place that he calls the castle, I think. The tiny castle, yeah. The tiny castle. But, um, anyway, so he came actually to the house that we did at the time. I was running a, a show slash practice house uh, in Annandale, Virginia called the cellar door. Um, and that's where we recorded it. And, uh, we just basically did, um, I think we did one live run through of everything, um, one take of, of all of it, um, with just the three of us. I think we separated, we put the guitar stack in one room and the bass stack in another room and then stood in the room with the drums. And luckily that basement, you know, accommodated that kind of setup really easily. Joe did one guitar overdub and then, um, and that was that. And there was uh, an interesting bit about that is that that Jotnar part, well, that opening part, as I'm sure you know, is really like kind of mm, loping and not very um, tempic, if that makes sense. Yeah. And, um, well, uh, <laughs> when it came to record it, we tried to record it to a, a metronome, but not a real, not like an out loud metronome, but we were watching like the flashing light on the metronome. <laughs> and so uh, when it came to, you know, lining up the overdub and stuff. Oh, it didn't, it was really bad. It yeah. did not work at all. <laughs> and so major, major credit to Noel, who was able to, you know, use his studio wizardry to kind of get that stuff to sound like we might have actually performed it live. <laughs> Hell yeah. Can you tell me a little bit about the artwork of who is depicted in it and what are they doing? Well, my idea um, originally with uh the 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 first record was we wanted it i honestly nobody's ever asked me about that before but i honestly wanted it to be like an agendered character yeah or maybe not agendered but at least like um um what's the word androgynous yeah. Like you could not necessarily assign a, a gender to it. And actually kind of part of my thinking on that was like that that would maybe reflect the views of the viewer of it more so than the artist. Like if you look at it and you think, oh, that's some, some badass dude, magician, uh, wizard, you know, then maybe that reflects that you think that only a, only a male could do that. Right. You know, um, where to me, I, I kind of wanted to leave it just open ended. And that the gender of that character doesn't particularly matter. But that's kind of a side point. But just kind of generally, like, it's supposed to be, like, a mage character who's kind of in training. And this character does sort of, as you ask about it, run through um, what I'm trying to create with, like, maybe the lyrical subject matter of this band, which um, is not, <laughs> I'm not going to say that it's, you know, terribly well thought out, <laughs> but as it goes, I'm building it. Um, and so this character has sort of gone through various travels and trials sort of throughout the lyrics of the songs that are not direct Tolkien references in our band. <laughs> right. And so in the second, in the second record, you see that character is basically sort of traveling toward, um, this volcanic, um, archipelago, um, where, there's basically going to be some sort of gathering of these mages for a purpose as yet unstated. 
That's awesome. I, I like how the stories intertwine and stuff. I don't know how you out heavied your debut, but you did. Second Sight, your sophomore album is just devastating. Was your inspiration or writing method changed in any way? Well, thank you so much for, for saying that. Um, and I would say, I mean, as far as the writing method, just to be honest, a lot of the early songs were, were written, a lot, the riffs were kind of written by me for at least the first, like, small handful of songs, which was all we had because they're all, I, I can't seem to write a song that's under 10 minutes long. But, but, um, anyway, well, the honest difference is that Joe was writing with us on that record. And so it's probably about being honest. It's probably like 55, 45 Joe's riffs versus my riffs on that record with actually some, some from Ben as well. Um, he wrote a couple riffs on the seer. Um, so that one was a lot more of like a group effort at that time. So honestly, you know, uh, there was a lot of strength, I think, in that, in that writing method and in those people involved. But, you know, it is what it is. People change and they move on. So. We don't really perform any material off of that record now. We basically, um, Ben and I have over the past two years written, um, somewhere about 70 minutes worth of music, I think. Is that right, Ben? That's actually not that long. I think it's like an hour. <laughs> awesome. Okay. So an hour, an hour spread across five songs. Um, yeah. one of which pretty much he wrote entirely, one of which pretty much I wrote entirely. And the other three, I mean, we met um, dead in the middle on the songwriting. Um, ben is an amazing songwriter in his million other bands that he does. <laughs> um, but I think some of the main ones right now, At the Graves, which is his solo project, um, where he plays all the instruments. Um, and it's pretty, it's pretty like jewel-worthy um, riffage. And... Uh, then, um, Immiseration, which is the sadly not yet live, live debuted, um, brutal death metal band, um, with some other, uh, sort of Baltimore area luminaries, um, which I'm sure he could tell you more about. Yeah. I mean, as, uh, it's kind of the band cursed by all this Corona shit. We had six shows canceled, like our first six shows. But, you know, yeah, it's, I've been, I've been trying to do some death metal shit for years and it's cool. We were finally getting going, you know, but then all this, but I don't know. I got like tons of songs and shit. But the EP is on, the EP is online and it is pretty jaw dropping. And if I'm not wrong, it's all, it's all you, right, Ben? Yeah, yeah, it's all me. I played all the instruments and shit. Fuck yes. Just a couple more questions about Second Sight and then we'll move on from that. Um, I can, I can hear more, like, evil hatefulness in the music, maybe because of the minor and dissonant chords. Could you say the same about the lyrics, Jay? I wouldn't use the word hateful, but we've certainly gotten that comment before. I forget who it was, but we played with some band, and they were like, man, you guys are pissed. Yeah. And I was like, I'm not really that pissed, you know, I like cats and um, anime and, like, you know, <laughs> but I am pissed, but I'm pissed about the current political situation, right? you know, but I, I don't try to live my life in an angry way or, or something like that. I'm sure that it certainly comes out in the feeling of the music that it's like, um, you know, it is certainly a release for me, at least. I know, I know, I can't speak for Ben, but I'm pretty sure that he feels the same way. <laughs> yeah. Um, but certainly, you know, I mean, we're, we're pouring our guts out into, into it musically, but, um, lyrically, it's not really, you know, you have a lot of metal. It's like either really, hmm, like politically charged and angry in that way, or you have other metal that's like kind of like, oh, I'm angry at women, so I'm going to write about killing them or, or something like that. I don't know what that's about. Um, right. But for me personally, it's like, uh, you know, honestly, like, well, <laughs> Lord of the Rings was one of my favorite things growing up. My mother read it to me when I was a child. That led me to sort of a, a general love of sci-fi and, and fantasy. Um, and, you know, I'd much rather write about, about something like that. You know, man, these times are so dire. And I think that it's, you know, I don't think that it's, that it's wrong to, we need people to comment on what's going on now. But for me personally, I would rather maybe provide somebody an escape because that's maybe how I 
what I feel is my strength more than trying to make some sort of political commentary and then have that fall flat on my face because I am not all that <laughs> knowledgeable. I've read a bunch of Chomsky and stuff, but I'm not going to say I'm an expert in anything, you know? Right. And uh, I, I really appreciate that. I love the fantasy sci-fi lyrics. And, you know, there's already enough of that political stuff. Yeah, or, there's so many people that would do that that would do that way better than me. Um, so just one more uh, about Second Sight, and then we'll move on to the other stuff. I noticed you departed from the black and white artwork to this beautiful and terrifying painting. What inspired the change, and who's the artist of that? At that time, when we were devising the, the cover concept for all that, and for the first one, frankly... I very much um, always try to have my bands be a democracy as far as how we make decisions. I would not ever be like, I'm I'm the ultimate authority on this stuff. So what we came to decide was that we wanted to do a color cover. We used the same artist from the first record, which was Luciana Nadalia, oh, okay. who's uh, from, from Transylvania, actually. Um, and we, our um, um, label guy, Pat Trainer who runs Australopithecus, who had agreed to put that record out on vinyl for us. Um, he actually suggested to do the etching for the fourth side. And then as you see that artwork, um, I honestly came up with the idea to do that um, sort of mandala, which is also uh, what's called a compass rose or a wind rose sometimes. Yeah. Um, and so that's that, that um, large circular thing um, that, uh, but I kind of, I was like, basically, I want to do a mandala, but I want it to be like a nautical themed mandala. Um, but the smaller decisions with these things, I always want to leave up to the artist because I want to respect them as an artist and allow them to inject as much of their personality into it as possible because otherwise, why are you doing it? I, I'm not just using this artist as a tool. I'm, I want, I want to collaborate with them, you know? So, so she came up with all the, there's like kelp in that. And there's like, you notice there's like rope, um, like, like, you know, you would use to lash a ship to the dock or something or, um, and again, but the, but the windrows idea was mine. Um, the, the idea for the cover as well, frankly, was mine. I'm not trying to take credit for everything, but, um, it just so happened that I happened to suggest that to the group and they liked it. So, so this is part of the first character's journey. I guess. Yeah. And honestly, we, we, um, we're going with a new artist for the next record. Her name is Rebecca Magar from York PA. Um, she is in a couple bands. Um, one with her husband, Brian, um, or two, I'm sorry, with her husband, Brian. Um, one is cultic who I'm sure you were aware of. I think you've played with them, Sam, right? Maybe. Yeah. And, um, <laughs> if not, maybe I'm confusing things, but, um, and, and also another band called The Owls Are Not What They Seem. Oh, um, yeah, cultic. that's awesome. The cultic is kind of a, kind of a, mm, I, I describe them as Celtic Frost meets Swans or something. Um, it's really dirty, heavy, oak, uh, kind of stuff. Okay. Um, and then, and then, the owls are not what they seem or maybe much more hard to describe, but kind of a free music collective with lots of interesting instruments and that sort of thing. But anyway, um, we just, to be quite honest, Rebecca's art for the cover of the cultic debut, we were both just gobsmacked by that. Um, especially, uh, they put us up one night after we played up there. And we got to see the original. Um, and I, you know, again, I can't speak for Ben, but I was like, oh my God. Yeah. <laughs> we have to have her do the next, the next cover. <laughs> Sometimes you just know like that. All right. So your last show you guys played as a two piece. Somehow it was just as pummeling and didn't lack any thickness at all. How was your stage set up different? And what gear did you use for the gearheads listening? Okay, for any gearheads listening, I run, I'll try to not be too ostentatious in my description of this, but I run a, a kind of complicated like stereo setup, um, with a, with a couple different switchers. Uh -huh. And what I do is I, I, I play like a regular six string guitar, but tuned to you know, drop A usually. Sort of. Um, <laughs> sort of drop A, more like the bottom six strings of a, of a seven string tuned in drop A. 
Um, cause I kind of wrote the stuff on a seven string to begin with and then it just kind of went from there. <laughs> ben, Ben, to his credit, is much more of a, of honestly a gearhead than me. And I come to him for advice on stuff all the time up to and including like literally minutes before this interview, we were going back and forth about DAWs and, and pedals and stuff. So um, that's like a constant, I think I frankly annoy him with how often I ask him about gear and stuff. <laughs> but uh, anyway, um, so so back to my setup, I basically, uh, I have to give all credit to Electro Harmonics um, for their amazing products. They, I was using a, uh, TC sub and up pedal, which, uh, I use on a lower octave to run to a bass amp. And I run that through its own sort of slew of effects. But that, the TC and most other octavers, to be honest, have this issue. Uh, the tracking is really good, but the, uh, there's no punch. There's no attack on the note. It kind of is more of like a warm, you know, it gets a really nice girthy sub octave, um, but it doesn't, it's not, it doesn't hit like a bass would hit. So Electro Harmonics came out with this pedal called the Bass 9. Um, I almost feel kind of like I don't want to give it away, but it is such a great product. I just have to get behind it. And it has like nine settings, as do all their kind of nine series pedals. There's like a Synth 9, which I also use. Um, there's a Mel 9, which is like a Mellotron emulator. But um, the Bass 9 does a really good job of there's like a precision based setting and there's like a virtual based setting where you can sort of vary the quote unquote scale length and body density of the base. Um, and through one or the other of those, you can really sculpt like a really, really nice and realistic bass sound. And, um, we just got done. We were going to get to this eventually, I guess, but, um, we just got done recording this five song new album not quite done. We still have to put the vocals on and do a little more editing on it, but it's basically in the can um, before this coronavirus um, pandemic hit. So <laughs> soon, soon we will have we'll have something from that. But on that recording, I was really impressed personally by the way that was able to emulate a, a real bass sound. I mean, it sounds like there's a bass player playing on it. So that kind of answers my next question. You guys are. Jamming as a two piece. This is going to be recorded as a two piece. Um, I love two pieces. Some of my favorite bands are. Um, is there any plans to add a bass player or a guitar player, or are you just going to continue like this? That's not to say if the perfect perfect opportunity presented itself that we wouldn't be amenable to something like that. But I I I agree with what you said, Sam. I, I think um, some of my favorite bands have been two pieces. It's certainly less logistics to worry about. Yeah. Um, I just happen to really get along really well with Ben. Um, you know, we have like a really, really good working dynamic, in my opinion. Um, we're like, you don't really, sometimes you're trying to write songs with people. It's like you're fighting with them. But with Ben, I've, I've never felt that way for even an instant. It's always been a super well expressed, uh, mutual respect. Oh, for sure. Yeah. So I mean, we we just, disagree about things occasionally, but like it's pretty. Uh, we keep it pretty, pretty chill. We have, and that's out of the respect that Jay was talking about. So for this so. new album, uh, without giving more information than you want to give, what can we expect for the new Faux Hammer album? Expect it to be different. That's for sure. Uh, there's a lot more variant in the tempos. Like you know, Faux Hammer as a very slow plotting band, you know, not plotting in a bad way, but like, you know, it's just like <laughs> beating you down with these riffs. But, uh, yeah, it's like, there's, there's some faster parts. There's some more dynamics going on. I feel like, so yeah, I'd say it's, it's not as a, like one, one dimensional kind of, you know, not that I think that was a bad thing with the other ones, but it's like, there's, there's a lot more going on on this one. But there was before there was kind of a um, focus on I really want this to be like the most pummeling doom hole generating kind of thing that I can possibly make, you know. Yeah. Um, but honestly, with this new material, it's like I said, um, one of the songs Ben wrote entirely, one of the songs I kind of wrote entirely, 
And then the other three were written like literally like 100% collaboratively. I think like literally riff for riff, it's like 50 yeah. 50. Yeah, we're um, talking riffs here. And we kind of just, I was like, one day I was like, we need new material. Let's just throw the fuck down. <laughs> yeah. And we just sort of just wrote those songs in like a flurry. And to be honest, it's like the most proud of anything I've ever done songwriting wise, I think. Um, and that's sort of like the second half of at least we hadn't really talked yet about um, song ordering, but uh, I think the idea is that the second half of the record is kind of the stuff that we wrote collaboratively and it really like ramps to the end, if that makes sense. Yeah. Fuck yeah, I'm really excited about that. Yeah, the I think most of the songs we played at that show uh, were were the what we're talking about now. I, like I, the, did, yeah. I did hear one with a blast beat. Is that on the new one? Yeah. Yeah, there's five beats and like all. <laughs> yeah, the I think there's, I think there's at least minimum, minimum three of the five in, contain blast beats. Fuck yeah. yes. <laughs> and that's that's what I was hinting at with the tempo variants. That's awesome. I love to hear that. But it's like if you can fit blast beats in like a doom milieu kind of, yeah. you know, that makes sense. Uh, there are some other bands that do a similar thing. I'm not trying to ape those bands, um, but. You know, no, I just, when I just you like kinda... playing blast beats, you know. So. <laughs> yeah, they're they're a lot of fun. And I and I like when he plays blast beats, so it works out. <laughs> <laughs> so after this virus craziness has passed, will you plan on touring to support the new material? Do so bad. I, I I think I I think I, again not to speak for Ben, but I think he he does as well. Um, I I'm really itching to get on the road. I, it's been a while, and I I'm like a road dog a little bit. Yeah. Um, when I've been on, when I've been on tour before, um, I did like a 32 day one with this band called black table out of New York. Uh-huh. And at the end of it, I was like, let's keep going. <laughs> 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 I could never, I could just never go home. I would love that if I could do it, but yeah. you know, you can't really do that on getting paid a hundred dollars a show. Yeah. Eventually the, the, you know, the money's going to run out. <laughs> <laughs> Unless you're eating like literally out of a bird seed or something. Or <laughs> <laughs> Is there any interested record labels, or are you going with the old one? You know, <laughs> we haven't really yeah, figured that out yet. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think Pat Australopithecus um, has kind of. I don't think he's really actively doing that label anymore, and so maybe he's going to hear this and have a different opinion, but I, I kind of got the feeling that he would not really be interested in doing the next one. Um, so we are kind of like, I've never done this before in my life, but we are kind of compiling like a like list of fantasy labels of like, if you could pick anybody to put it out, like who would you pick? Yeah. And I think we're just going to throw it at him and just see if there's any interest. Yeah. You never And know. if there's, if there's not, then like, I absolutely would not be opposed to doing some sort of hand packaged, um, self release kind of thing. But, you know, if, if someone wants to do the legwork for us on that, of course, we're gonna, we're gonna hop on that opportunity. Definitely. So how are you guys handling the whole stay at home order? Sepultura live streams. <laughs> <laughs> um, watching Ben's Sepultura live streams. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Um, probably, uh, you know, um, <laughs> I've been alphabetizing my record collection. That's one thing. <laughs> um, I did my taxes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I should say our taxes. I'm married now, so. Yeah. That'll keep you occupied. Um, well, and we were like, oh, well, there's a stimulus check coming, so I better, I better get my taxes in, like, right freaking now. <laughs> right on. Yeah, that'll keep you occupied. So, I guess the last question is, where would you guys like to see yourselves in a few years? Yeah, I mean, like Dave was saying, hopefully we get to tour this material and kind of, you know, get it out to more people. And then write in a new record, I guess. Yeah, I mean, I, I personally already have, have some riffs floating around that are that are post this new material. We haven't really approached it yet together, um, just because there just hasn't been the time yet. Yeah, we were still we were still working on the record when this whole thing kind of hit, and then now it's been like I think three weeks, or this would be like the fourth week I think that we haven't practiced. 
um, just out of, again, like observing the social distancing um, protocols, you know, and it's just sad, but it's, it is what it is. Um, better, <laughs> better we should all be safe apart than, you know, die together or something like that, right? Right. It's been killing me, too, not being able to go practice every Sunday and stuff. Mm-hmm. Yeah. We kind of tossed around the idea of, like, um, Ben could come by my apartment since we've both been pretty well quarantined and then but just maintain social distancing, like, yeah. in the apartment and do some sort of practice or something. But I don't know if it's actually going to happen or not. We might just have to wait until it, until the air clears, so to speak. Yeah. For sure. I got a uh, quarantine grindcore album written, so that's something. Yeah, let us speak oh, yeah. to it on the channel. Word, yeah. Once I, yeah, once I release it, I'll definitely uh, let you know. Fuck yeah. Do you have a name for that yet, Ben? I'm I'm throwing a few around. Centrist uh, Guillotiner is one of my ideas. Centrist Guillotiner? <laughs> yeah. That's amazing. <laughs> well, thank you, gentlemen, so much for your time. Thank you. Sam, thank you so much, man. We really appreciate you, dude. And uh, you throw some amazing shows uh, down there. And um, again, like as soon as the dust clears, we want to come back down and 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 hit it again. I'll I'll do it definitely. Um, I was really stoked to get to interview you guys for my channel. You're one of my favorite bands. Your music feels like smoking yourself into a coma and getting like <laughs> completely flattened yeah. to like two dimensional. You know what I mean? Like, mom, <laughs> mom, if you're listening, I have never smoked weed. <laughs> <laughs> So, <laughs> yeah, I've never even heard of that. I don't even know what that is. <laughs> All right, so we're talking like dan- dandelions or something. Or I just don't even know. <laughs> so, if you guys haven't already, pick up a copy of Second Sight by Faux Hammer. Uh, stay tuned for the new album. Please like or leave a comment on the video and let us know what you think. Don't forget to subscribe to Subterranean Annihilation for more underground music. Thanks for listening, and see you next time.